All right, so uh, that was pretty cool. I love the breakout groups. So next what we're going to do is we're going to have somebody speak here. And this is somebody that has a very inspirational story. Um, pretty much a lot of the times that I find an inspirational story, it's not they get rich really quick or it's gangster or really cool off the bat, right? It's a very slow, slow, slow process. And some of the people you saw here today, some of the people with the blue on them right, They've come to me before they got the first wholesaling deal. And they get super excited when they get that. And then eventually, half of them stop and half of them keep going, right? Uh, this particular case was somebody that annoyed the snot out of me starting out. They went on every one-on-one -on -one call. And they kept hammering me, hammering me, hammering me, hammering me. And they kept going, which was good. And eventually, they got their first wholesaling deal. They tried to send it to me as a JV deal. And I called them up saying, hey, let's, let's sh try to see this deal. And I was like, eh, I was skeptical. It was a Zillow Fizbo. I was like, eh, it's OK. And um, you know, I, call, I, I call him up like, hey, are we still looking at JV? He said, no, I got it. And he proceeded for the next 45 minutes to talk about he made $5,000 on his first deal, and his life's changed. And I was like, that's great. Well, why don't we just keep going? And uh, he didn't stop. He kept coming on the one-on-ones, kept talking to me and Rick, and uh, a little Southern accent. And uh, he just kept doing it. He was in a very small market in a tough situation, and he just kept doing it. And eventually, that first deal led to the second, third, fourth, and uh, eventually right now. So uh, we're going to have Corey Whitley speak. Thank you. Thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. And I just want to start before I even get into this. And uh, I just want to give a round of applause and a thank you to the two gentlemen that truly helped me escape my matrix. So a little bit about myself going back, there is absolutely zero reason why I should be here today. I come from no money. No one in my family has any money. No one in my family has any real estate experience whatsoever. And I've never even bought my own house. I live in a house that belongs to one of my wife's family members. So, you know, I grew up very poor, no real education. I didn't go to college, went straight into the workforce, 100% blue collar work, spent some time in the military and, uh, I'd always felt throughout my entire life like I was lacking something. I was always, you know, trying to chase the next opportunity, trying to chase the, the next level for myself and try to better my family at the same time. And uh, when I got out of the military, I got into what I thought at the time was a relatively good field of work, working in the oil and gas industry. I was making probably $80,000 a year. I was, you know, in my early 20s and I had absolutely no life. I worked away from home nine months out of the year, 14 days on, seven days off, 17 hour shifts. And I just couldn't do that anymore. So I got fed up with that and decided, you know, I'm gonna have to take a massive pay cut to go back home just to spend time with my family. Cause at the time I had my second child, I had my wife and I just needed to be back home with my family. So I took the pay cut and I went back home and, and everything just started falling apart. Couldn't pay the bills, couldn't make it. I went from making 80,000 to 30. And I had a lifestyle, you know, I had bills off of making $80,000. So, you know, the struggle, it, it was a really big struggle. And I, I'd always felt like there was something else that I needed to do. And I remember one day I was riding down the road and I was riding passenger seat and I was scrolling through TikTok and I came across somebody else. We're not going to say it was, but somebody else who was pitching wholesaling courses. And I was like, man, that looks like something that that might be real. I don't really think I can do it, but it, it looks, you know, decently real but I don't have like the $7,000 for the course and I'll, I'll, there's no way I can come up with that money. It's impossible. So I was like, I would like to learn a little bit more about this wholesale and stuff, but if I can't figure it out myself or for free, then I'm just SOL, I guess. I'll just stay where I'm at. I've always been that person to try to YouTube university it before I spend any money on some real educational mater material. So I got on YouTube and I was like, okay, I just searched wholesaling real estate, found some videos from other people. And I was like, you know, I don't really, I don't really like how I'm having this, this mentorship just crammed down my throat. They're trying to sell me things. And I came across a video of Zach's and he was actually showing about driving for dollars. And I was like, man, I could do that. There's a house right down the street from me. It looks like crap. So, so I started watching all of their content and I was like, man, the more I started watching their content, I was like, these guys are legit. And from what I could tell at the surface, they're going to teach me how to truly do this for free. So I started taking a little bit of action. I was like, you know, looking at it from the start, I was like, I need, the quickest way 
and the cheapest way and the fastest way to find a deal. And I remember I got on YouTube that day and Zach, I believe it was one of his videos where he cold calls Zillow for sale by owner's love. And I was like, well, in a pretty small market, the likelihood of me finding a good deal of Zillow for sale by owner is pretty low, but I'm gonna look on there. I looked on there, the gentleman had the property on there for $50,000, I believe. And I got it under contract, assigned it, made $5,000. And I know it sounds, sounds funny when Zach explains like that $5,000 changed my life, but it really did because once I had that $5,000, I had the opportunity to, I was committed at that point. I had proof of concept and I could take that $5,000 and pay for stuff that I couldn't afford before. So prop stream, that's $100 a month. Skip tracing, 12 cents a pop, but I was using true people, but the time, I needed to do some more volume. So I was able to afford those things that, that I needed to take me to that next step, that next level at that point, which was a baby step, but it was a step in the right direction. So I got with Zach and Rick, they told me you know, what they felt like would be the appropriate next step for me. And I chose to start you know, really diving into driving for dollars and things like that. And I found what worked for me and I just scaled it and I stayed consistent at it. And, and that's you know, what I really wanna tell you all about this business. I hear a lot of people saying, you know, I did, I did a little bit of this, you know, I, I put 30 sticky notes out and I got a call or two, but I didn't get no deals. It's not enough. You have to do more. The minute you get comfortable, you're not doing enough. You always have to be uncomfortable because if you're not uncomfortable, that means you're being complacent. And once you get complacent, you need to just take it to the next level. You look at your situation and say, what can I do to scale my business to the next level? So starting out, you just got to identify what, you know, what works for you in your market, what works for you as a person, what works with the time that you have and capitalize on it and, you know, make the most out of it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You know, starting out, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I spent hours a day driving for dollars, spending a ton of money on gas. And, you know, cause I was still working a full-time job at the time. So I had a unique schedule where I would get seven days in a row off and, uh, Leading up to the seven days, I would get all my marketing material ready. Like my list, I'd you know, go out and tag houses, everything ready to go. And I would get to the seven days and I would just call like eight hours a day for seven days straight. And I usually could get a contract. And then it came to a point that uh, this is the part where I escaped my matrix. I remember I was at work one day and the job I had at the time, I was working at a glass plant, manufactured tempered flat glass, terrible job, going nowhere fast. And uh, I'd actually got hurt on the job and I was on light duty and <laughs> they were giving me all the crap work. <laughs> they gave me a scanner, said, go out here in this warehouse and scan these 8,000 racks of glass that have been there for about 30 years. And oh, by, all, by the way, all the barcodes have fallen off so you can find them on the floor. And I was like, at the time I, I had about 35,000 in escrow and I had some money in the bank for some deals that I'd done. And I'm like, what am I even doing here right now? Like this is costing me money to be here, you know? So I was like, it's ready to step it up a little bit. I'm ready to take it to the next level. So I walked up to my boss and I was like, hey, you know, I appreciate everything, but I think I'm gonna head home. And he's like, you, you quitting or what? I said, yeah, I'm done here. And he's, you know, wanted to know what I was going to do. I told him, told some of my buddies. They told me I was crazy and uh, told me I probably needed to be committed somewhere, mental institution. And uh, they all told me, hey, we'll see you in a couple months. And I'm like, hey, no, you won't. And I walked out the door and I'll tell you, that was the most, uh, right underneath this, that was the most nervous moment of my life. <laughs> when I was walking out like, man, should I just turn around and tell my boss I'm sorry? <laughs> and I was like, but no, I have like 30,000 in the bank. So worst case scenario, I'll make it for three months and I found a job. I was looking for a job when I found that one. So worst case scenario, I was gonna find another job. But I was like, now I have time. And at that point, and I've talked to several people in here, and I feel like that you did this, and it's very easy. At that point, you got some money in the bank, you've done a little bit of deals, you're away from your job, you're like, oh, I've made it now. I can prop my feet back for a couple minutes and relax and enjoy this little bit of success I've got. And you know, I'll, I'll start back marketing heavy next week. Take your foot off the gas for one second, you just affected your profitability, your business for the next six months. I've experienced, I've been there. So, you know, as soon as I quit my job, I was like, okay, I need to get into doing some more things now. So I did a few more deals with the methods that I was doing and I was ready to truly take it to the next level. And I remember I got with Rick one day, I was like, Rick, I'm completely overworked. I'm making a lot of money, but it's 100% sweat equity. 
And I was like, I need to do something different. And uh, he, t he recommended direct mail to me, and that's what I chose to go with. And you know, been very successful with direct mail. That helped me take my business to the next level. And now I'm kind of at that point where I'm starting to get a little bit comfortable again. I'm looking for what can I do to take it to the next level from here. And that's what I was hoping to get out of this event. And I've got a lot of really good ideas that I look forward to trying. Um, but just everything about this program, it's, it's truly, it truly has changed my life. Uh, like I said, there's no reason why I should be here today. I don't consider myself even really smart. I mean, I know what I know because they've told me. And I kept it simple as I was going along. I did what they told me to do. When I ran into a problem, I was like, crap, now what? I was like, just got with Rick or Zach. I asked them, hey, here's what's going on. What do I need to do? And whatever they told me to do, it's exactly what I did. So I have people reach out to me all the time. Hey, Corey, I see, you know, I've seen your podcast or whatever it may be. And people are going to reach out to me after this. And they're like, what did you do? How did you do so many deals? And, you know, they want to know what the secret sauce is. And I'm here to tell you there is none. There is no secret sauce. There's nothing I did that was special. I just did what they told me. I followed the course to a T. So I see a lot of times people will, will say, you know, they told me to pull a thousand code violations and cold call them. And I did 600 and I, I didn't get any deals. Well, does anybody in here think 600 is more than a thousand? No. So you need to do what they say. You got to do, you got to do the volume. So, you know, that's all it takes is, is commitment. Like I said, you have to be uncomfortable. You just have to. If you're comfortable, you're not doing enough. Like right now, to be honest, this makes me pretty uncomfortable, but <laughs> this is a good thing for me because I will never probably feel uncomfortable doing this again. And it's strange because I could stand in front of a whole family and there's in the cellar and their whole family and and almost lowball them into oblivion and it doesn't bother me one bit. It's just what you have to do to do the deal. But this is a little bit different. You guys are staring at me like you want to eat my soul out. <laughs> Please don't kill me. Um, but yeah, so I, I've just tried to keep this business for me as simple as possible and replicate it and find what works and replicate it and scale it. Um, you know, and I chose to do my local market. I only do like a select virtual market or two and I call them virtual sparingly because they're within driving distance if I have to go there. If I've got a really good deal on the line and I want to try to go look at it, I can go look at it, but I will mostly try to work those deals virtually. Um, you know, I would take on virtual markets, but I need to bring some more people onto the team to handle that volume. I mean, let's just be honest here. It's time for me to grow more to that next level. And uh, I understand there's probably some of you in here that have done several deals and looking to get to the next level. And there's some of you that have, haven't done any deals or maybe one deal. And I, I can tell, I've talked to pretty much all of you in here, every single one of you and anybody who's taken the time to watch this online, you have it in you. You have what's required inside of you. You just have to find it. You have to harvest it and take the action and just go get after it and get uncomfortable and do the work. That's all it takes. Do the work and the results will come. And that's, that's really the simplest way I know how to explain it. I don't, I don't know what to say more about that. I would be glad to answer some questions. Thank you. Yes, sir. Starting out, that was the primary way that I was harvesting leads because I was explaining this to some people earlier. Until I got to the point that I was ready to handle the volume of pulling a list and, and cold calling at scale and things like that, I felt like I had a much better return on time by physically laying my eyes on a property that I could physically see was distressed. I knew it was vacant, whatever it may be. I seen it with my own eyes. So I know there's a good chance there that if I can just get in contact with those people that they might do a deal. So it was, for me, it was a lot quicker return on time because I didn't really have the time to sit and just and call for hours and hours and hours until I was at that point. So starting out when I needed fast, quick money, fast, quick deals, I would go out and I would try to find the low hanging fruit. And that's the easiest way to get started is the low hanging fruit until you get the money to do you know, more broader marketing to harvest some of that fruit that's not as low hanging. And that's where you start finding your better deals at. Yes, sir. 
So I use PropStream to drive. I would tag everything on there. I skip traced it all with batch leads. Uh, starting out, whenever I was just, just starting, I'll be honest, I tagged everything on Google Maps with a pin drop and skip traced it on two people search and cold called it with Google Voice. And I did deals that way. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would have her drive me, or I would drive and she would tag and she would miss the property. I'm like, we gotta go back now, that was so juicy. So, and then it would mess my whole route up. <laughs> Cause you'd get in a good area, you try to get a good grip pattern going, you're like, oh, no, my whole route's messed up, man. I can't go back, that's a one way street. So, uh, but yeah, I kept it very simple to start until I had the money to spend on some of the processes and skip tracing and stuff. And then I used prop stream to track. Uh, I know a lot of people use Dill Machine. I've never personally used it, so I had, PropStream did everything I needed, and I personally prefer PropStream data over anything else anyway, so I used PropStream data, skip traced it with batch, and then used a triple line dollar with batch. I tried Mojo there for a while, but it didn't work very good, so. Any other questions? When did you start? January of last year was when I got my first deal. I started following them about November of 2021, and uh, took a couple months there stuck in semi-analysis paralysis, and I was like, well, oh, I need to try to make some money now, so I guess I'll try to just do a deal. And that's when I got the first deal there. So I'll be coming up on my two-year mark here in you know, a couple months. So I feel like it's, I've been blessed, it's been good. So I did over 30 last year. I'd have to go back and count how many we did this year, but it's probably close to 60 transactions now at this point. And, uh, <laughs> And I know that sounds like you're looking at it like, man, that goal is like way up there. And starting out, I was like, man, I'll take one deal, let alone like five. <laughs> anybody, I was, you know, anybody got a deal I could have, you know? So, but once you get rolling, like I was telling this to the group I was with, you know, you take your marketing and you get a system going. And once you get the system going, and you just replicate it, then the deals will start coming in. And you know like clockwork, hey, I'm gonna do this marketing, I'll probably have two or three contracts within the next 30 days. I mean, would you all agree with that? So, it's just, you, you replicate it. Yes, sir. If you've done 90 to 100 deals, how many have you lost, would you say, and why do you think you've lost them? So, as far as termination goes, um, one of the big things with anybody terminating deals is locking them up too high. I had my fair share of that when I first started. Locking them up too high. Um, one recently we had to terminate was due to estate issues and things like that. We couldn't legally buy the property. Um, have a lot of that. Have some, I've had some run-ins with the cities putting demolition liens on properties. They say, hey, you can't buy it, we're tearing it down. Um, I have lost some deals to sellers, kind of, I don't want to say shafting me because I exposed myself to this, but let me think of a way to explain it. I guess me doing more than I should have done before I had it locked up and I just made it easier for them to do the deal with someone else. So, but never really had a problem for the most part with deals that have been locked up with selling them because if you just follow and run the numbers pretty conservatively the way they tell you, you can sell these deals to anybody. I mean, I have a waiting list of buyers right now that are waiting for deals. Like I know somebody, they're looking for duplexes, get in line, I've got five people that want duplexes. So, and I, and I don't really like to have a waiting list. I go with who do I know you know, if I get a three, two, 1500 square foot house and it needs about 30 K in work, you know, for one, if it's a hotel, I'm buying it myself. So, but if I'm going to assign it and I know, Hey, uh, John Doe, he buys these three twos all the time. I'm going to call him and I'm going to sell that deal off of a phone call. And, and it's, it's simple, you know? So yes, sir. I would have to figure the average to factor them all in, but really my average is around like 15 to 20,000 is pretty standard to what we get. Now we've had plenty of outliers in there. I had a 70K assignment, several in the 40s and 30s, and I've had them as low as like 1,200 bucks that I just did the deal because it was the right thing to do for the seller. I mean, they were in a bad spot. I didn't care if I made any money on it. I wasn't gonna spend money to close that deal, but I helped them out and they were very thankful at the end of the day. And it got me another deal when they told their friend that I bought houses cash. So on average, we make around 15 to 20,000 on a deal. Hotels, we're making about 45 to 50 on those. Uh, yes, sir, in the gray here. Are you funding hotels yourself? 
Yes and no. A lot of times we'll get private lending for the acquisition and fund our rehab unless uh, we can get seller financing or something like that. I always try to get seller financing on something. It's cheaper than private money. If the seller and their situation fits the criteria, I'm 100% pitching it to them because you can get it. It's easy. Yes, sir. So local Facebook real estate groups, I have two in my market and cold call and cash sales. Anytime I get in a new area and I get a deal and I'm like, man, I don't really know who would buy this. I don't have any buyers in this market. Cold call cash sales, like they said, as long as you know the right questions to ask those people, you can find buyers, no problem. But I've had pretty good success with the Facebook groups. You know, you just post some deals on there, the buyers, they will blow your inbox up. What's that? So, so my market, uh, it actually fits in pretty in line with what they have laid out for a good market. Um, my city has about 56,000 people in it. The county has about 110. And I live in an area that's it's called the Tri-Cities. It's composed of several cities. And it's not too rural in between. Uh, so it's still desirable areas all over. So they consider that one large metropolitan area but it's nothing like Knoxville or Nashville, so you're not gonna hear about it too much. Um, and that combined area there has about 550,000 people in it. The average home price in my city is about 270. If you go into the other city, it's about 300. Any other questions? No? It wasn't quite an hour, I don't think, but. Oh, oh okay, sorry. Yeah, I'll break down my why. I'd love to break that down. So as y'all see, I have a beautiful wife right here. Um, I have three children at home. I, don't, I really don't think I would have been able to make it without her because there were some days that I probably would have just put my head through a wall. She wasn't like, it's okay, we'll, we'll be all right. <laughs> we'll make it through this. Um, but I have three beautiful children at home. We just had our third child in January. And uh, like I was saying, when I, when I grew up, I grew up very poor. Um, single mom, my dad wasn't around, he still really isn't. I talk to him every now and then. Um, he chose that, it is what it is. Um, but my mom, she did the best she could, and uh, single mom, and I remember distinctly, you know, some of those vivid memories that you just, they just stick with you from your childhood forever. Uh, one of the distinct ones I remember is being in the buggy at Walmart, and I wanted a 97 cent hot wheel car, and my mom didn't have the money to buy it because we were there with food stamps only. So that's what I came from, and, um, and, and my wife's family's kind of the same way. I mean, we'll just be honest. Neither one of us had any money. I mean, when we got married, we were completely broke. Um, so the fact that I'm here now, I don't think I, I got lucky or anything like that. What I really believe is that I talked to the right people took the right action, and was very blessed. That's, that, that's what I firmly believe. Um, but my why, because I just didn't want my kids to ever have to go without like I did. And my son was my first child, and he had some pretty unique health problems. So, you know, I live in Tennessee. We still, to this day, pretty regularly have to take him all the way to Cincinnati, Ohio, to the children's hospital there. He has a team of heart doctors, brain doctors, psychiatrist and all kinds of other doctors and you know luckily at the time when he was born we didn't make very much money so we had some insurance that covered all that and once I started working I could not afford his health bills it was thousands of dollars just to go for a regular visit thousands so he could run up a six-figure medical bill just like that so um, you know that really motivated me ever since he was born to I really needed to figure out something that I could do to change my family's life. And like I said, I'd always felt like there was just something missing there. I just hadn't figured out what it was yet. I would try something and yeah, I would find some success. I'd make some money doing this or that, whatever it may be. I'd be good at something and I'm like, but this just ain't it. I just, just don't feel it. I still feel empty here, right, in the heart. It just doesn't feel like what I'm supposed to do. So when I came across Wholesale and I, I talked to my wife about it and I was like, you know, I really think this could be good for us. If I could just figure this out, it could change our lives. And you know, love her heart. She's like, yeah, honey, I think you can do it. <laughs> Thinking to herself, please God, just, just show them what to do. 
And uh, I feel like she had confidence in me once I had showed her proof of concept. Up to that point, uh, I don't know. What do you think, honey? Did you believe me? Did you believe in me? Yeah. Yes and no. <laughs> I never heard of her, so. All right. Um, but yeah, so that was my why. I just wanted to be able to change my children's lives. I never wanted to see my kids go without, and I wanted to be able to spend more time with my kids because from the time my son and my first daughter, uh, how old was JC when I stopped working in oil and gas? And she's like probably two or three. So from the time they were both born up until then, I missed them growing up. I didn't really get to spend too much time with them when they were babies. Like I said, I would come home for seven days, go back on the road for 14 plus. Um, so that was my why. I really wanted to be able to spend more time with my kids. And now I can spend as much time as I want with them. My wife doesn't have to work. She's a stay-at-home mom. She's with my kids every day. I take a break. I go pick them up from school, come home, get them settled in, go back to work, finish my day out, and I get to spend as much time with my children as I want. And that's what matters most to me. I really relate a lot to Rick in that aspect, which is why I really found a lot of trust in him whenever I was joining the mentorship and everything. I really knew that if he has those values that I share, that I could trust him. And that's what you know, guided me in my decision to, to go with them as my, my mentors. A lot of times, what, once you identify those areas within their market, if you're gonna pull a list on PropStream, you can use that box method on there to try to hone in on those really good areas that you know of versus just saying, hey, I wanna pull a list in you know, Port St. Lucie County or whatever this county's called here, I don't know. You, know, you would encompass that whole county but some of those areas might only be the ones that you want to target. So I personally like to use that box method. On PropStream, you can draw a box around the areas that you want to pull your list from, and you can narrow your data down like that. Yes, sir. You're saying, how do I not market to the same people and over and over again? And keep finding new deals? Yeah. So I don't get hung up too much on if I'm going to be sending the same marketing material to the same people again. Obviously, you don't want to mail the same house this week and next week or something like that. But if I mailed them three months ago and I mailed them again, like three months later, I don't care because who knows what happens during that three months. Like, I've seen people tell me no one day that they don't want to sell and seen, you know, they do the deal with somebody else or even call me like a week later. It, stuff happens that quick. So motivation changes every day. So I will change the criteria in general. I have a rotation that I do within the areas. So by the time I get back around to that first area, it's been long enough that even if I pulled the exact same list again, it, it personally wouldn't really matter too awfully much to me. But I always kind of you know, tweak the criteria around a little bit to get the numbers where I want because different times of the year, you're always going to get different results. You know, there's up seasons and slow seasons. So I kind of tweak everything going along to try to you know, make the list as effective as possible you know, going throughout everything. So what is your marketing Direct mail is the main thing, cold calling. We have uh, banner signs that we do. Um, we was running Facebook ads. Pulled the plug on that, didn't work out too well for us. Kind of like how Rick said it would go down <laughs> is exactly how it went down. Uh, I'll just tell you, like, we got over 100 leads in probably 30 to 45 days, and a lot of them just, they were like either really far out, really long term plays, which if you got good follow up, you may be able to do that deal in the future, or they wanted <laughs> retail plus plus, is what I like to say. Uh, they wanted like 2001 ARV of the property, or you know, they weren't even really looking to sell anyways, they were just curious what their home was worth and they thought if they entered the info, they would get an instant offer. So that was our story with uh, Facebook ads there, it didn't really work out too well, but direct mail, very good. Cold calling, very good. Bandit signs, um, it's not a lot of work for us to do them, it doesn't have a lot of cost. I got a really good sign supplier, I can get a good deal on them, so we have people that put them out for us, and we'll pull a couple deals off that, so it makes it profitable and worth it. Um, but those are the three main things we focused on. We was doing SMS pretty heavy there for a while. We chose to stop just because we were having a lot of problems with our numbers getting flagged to spam, text not getting delivered, getting shut down for the day. Just a lot of problems, so we chose to scale up cold calling and direct mail more, and we've had good success with those. Yes, sir. 
for hotels. So a lot of hotels that we've gotten recently have kind of fit into one criteria and I didn't necessarily mark it specifically to this and maybe I could get with you all and figure out a way that I could target this. Um, but all these properties fit this criteria. A lot of them were owned by the original owners. And those people were still alive. The properties needed a lot of work. They were looking to move into an apartment or something like that and just get out of the house. But I really think that attributed a lot to the community I was in because the community that I was kind of targeting when I've got all the most recent hotels was a community of all brick houses that was built back in the 70s. And when those people bought them, that was working class and they work and they paid it off and they, most of them lived there until they pass away. Um, but I was able to find a lot of people that, you know, they've got the two story brick house or and they're old, they can't get up and down the steps anymore. Or it needs work. They want to go into an apartment. They have 100% equity in the deal and the property. And, uh, you know, we was able to find, you know, relatively good hotel deals like that. And then, you know, but any kind of, any kind of the ways that you would go about finding a deal, whether something's going to be a hotel or not, just comes down to, um, what's the condition like on it? I don't want to spend like $30,000 rehabbing a property. I want to spend like five, maybe 10, be in and out with the work on like two or three weeks and have it on the market and sell it. Because the, like every day you hold it, it costs you money. Um, so I wouldn't recommend anybody really get into wholesaling until you've done, really in my opinion, at least like 15 or 20 wholesale deals and you know your numbers to a T. And you know how to inspect a property to a T. You know because I've been there when I, we first started closing on him. You think, oh yeah, everything's good. This thing needs like 40 grand. Next thing you know, you're stroking a check for 20,000 that you didn't have in the budget. Ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, just another tip. Personally, I probably would never deal with properties on well water because that was what that 20K was. <laughs> the well was flowing great when we closed. Went out there the next day, dry as a bone. $20,000 later, we had a nice well. Um, but yeah, yes ma'am. So I have one business partner now that I partnered up with a couple months into my journey. And, you know, he brought some marketing to the table. I brought some marketing to the table. We were both kind of doing different things and both seeing success. And we just combined our efforts together and we still work together to this day. And it's very rare that that happens, but him and I just, it's just meant to be. We, we work really good together. Um, but other than that, we have some VAs. We have one American person that he was uh, like a VA for us. I don't want to call him a VA, but... He was cold calling for us. Now he kind of runs all of our VAs and we're slowly trying to get him into the role of an acquisitions, you know, person. Um, I still go on my own appointments. I run most of the inbound marketing for our business. So when any of the inbound calls come in, I'm answering them. Uh, my business partner, if he gets leads and appointments from outbound marketing, he goes on the appointment. So we're still on the ground doing a lot of it. And that's kind of um, what I think is attributing to us plateauing a little bit here because you only have so much time you can only look at so many houses a day and really when you get to this level it's all about making like as many offers as possible on good deals I feel like um, so yeah we've got it really simple right now but I will 100% agree we need we need to take that to the next level that's what I'm looking for yes yes Luca yes sir So he is virtual right now. He lives out of, the, out of the country, but he is an American. And uh, so that is one kind of thing we were taking in consideration. Um, but he's just so dang good on the phones, man. <laughs> he's like real good. And he's really good with speaking with people because he's an English teacher. Um, so we get some VAs and he's really good at training the VAs and we have kind of molded him into what we needed, you know, what needs we needed him to fill for our business. And he's worked out great. So I've had key people along the way help me out and that's what it's all about, forming relationships with people, doing business with people that you know is in the business and, you know, just forming relationships. But um, that's a good question. Uh, ultimately, in a perfect situation, I would have an acquisitions manager that's local so I didn't have to go on the appointments. For me personally, I feel like that's probably the last thing I would ever hire out. Because the last thing I would want to trust somebody with for the most part is the deal, right? So a disposition agent is probably what I'll hire first and then try to get a local acquisition agent and then you know, free some more of my time and scale it up even more from there. But 
I've been talking with Rick over the last couple of months. Like it's, it's hard to even get a person to answer the phone on inbound marketing. Like I just like, I need somebody to answer the phone for my direct mail or bandit signs or whatever it may be. It's hard to get somebody. And I feel like with anything in life, it's, it, it's harder to find somebody that will be as committed or more committed than, than you are at anything. And I'm a little bit of a control freak. Like I feel like I follow a lot of the things that you were saying. I'm like, I don't know if I can relinquish that over to you unless like you have to prove it to me that you can do this. And I really feel like I, I probably just need to find somebody that I trust and just, worst case scenario, they cost me a little bit of money and I figure it out and, and fix the problem. But it's a struggle, man. <laughs> yeah, Grant. How many mailers are you sending out a month? 10,000. Uh, so after I, I'll pull a list of about 10,300. By the time I filter it down through open letter and move duplicates and stuff like that, it ends up being anywhere from like nine to 9,500. It just depends on how many I'm getting in. Um, so that's what I try to consistently do some months. I might send less. It really just kind of depends on what kind of volume I have coming in. Cause like I said, I've been having to answer all the calls. So if I'm completely overwhelmed, I might, you know, do a 10,000 mailer campaign. I might send like six for two or three batches and then go back to 10 just to, cause I don't want to lose deals due to lack of follow up, but it's hard to follow up when you're answering a call, you're on a call. You get another call coming in and you already had two follow-ups you were supposed to do. And by the time you get off the call, you've got two more already. So you're like constantly trying to dig yourself out of a hole. So right now it's like, I would love to send a lot more, but I can't. If I did, it would probably, the ROI would decrease. I would start losing deals at that point. Um, yeah. So I use the ROS postcard. It's what, like 52 cents a postcard? It usually costs me about five grand. That's the right way. Last question. What age? <laughs> so you've been through Corey's entire journey. I want you to tell him what you are most proud of him through his entire journey. You've seen it, ups and lows. What, what's, the most, what's the one thing you're most proud of? Oh, man. <laughs> um, I'm a little emotional. Oh, it's going to Sorry. Sorry. Can you come up here? This is what it's about, people, right here. This is what it's about. This is what it's about for me right here. This is why I do this. Her and my children, and I can't wait to get back home to them. This is why I do this. And this is why I... There's no amount of money I could pay Zach or Rick that I ever feel like would, would fully show them how much gratitude I have for what they've done for me. I'm a crybaby, but <laughs> I cry at the drop of a hat. But um, me and him, we come from nothing. And we live paycheck to paycheck. We had kids, and it was, it was hard. And uh, I, remember, I remember him coming home one day and was like, okay, well, I'm going to quit my job. It's, it's costing me money. I'm going to do this full time, full time. And I was like, whoa. The look on her face. <laughs> like, all right, I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm going to go with it. Um, he put so much work and hard work and effort in on the road. He, come on, get in the car. Let's go. We're getting 600 properties today. Two days. Literally. Then I'm going to go home and I'm going to start. She'd be like, we're hungry. We need to stop. I say, all right, we're taking like a 30 minute lunch break. We got 200 houses left to tag today. Yeah. Um, so he'd go home. I mean, it was nine, 10 o'clock at nine. I'd, on the computer, um, I did all the work with my kids and he'd still be working. Such a hard worker. It, it takes a lot, a lot of hard work, a lot of patience. Um, if you get married and have kids, um, there's going to be a lot of bumpy roads. You're going to yeah. bicker back and forth. Or, you need to take out the trash. You need to do this. And, Sorry, honey. I had a seller. I had a deal on the line. Yeah. <laughs> I know the trash truck just ran, but I had a deal yeah. on the line. Yeah, that did happen. Um, I've gotten better about that. I, I, I learned to do it the day before. <laughs> Patience is the key. 
Um, you're going to have bumpy roads. Uh, he's going to work a lot. Or women, if you're working, husbands, she's going to work a lot. Yeah. It is, it, patience is the key. Hard work, motivation. I've seen my husband get up. Um, most of the nights he don't get in bed till three, Wait. four o'clock in the morning because he's in there on his computer. Like if I, if I, if there's stuff with deals going on in my mind, I lay my head down at like eleven o'clock. I like physically can't. I have to square everything away before I can go to sleep, or I can't. And that, that's just how I am. Maybe I have ADHD. Yes. Pretty much, because like, and it affects me if I want to take a vacation. I'm like, man, if I go like, if I go hiking for the day, how much money am I going to miss out on? It really bothers me. I'm getting better about it, but at first I was like, man, I, I can't take a day off. He will not. Um, we haven't had a lot of vacations at the beginning because um, he just no time. stuck to it. He's addicted to it. Um, no time. He's he strangers on the street. We talk about wholesale and what he does constantly. And I'll tell everybody about it, and they all look at me like, you're crazy, dude. And I'm just like, hey, you two flip with Rick. Look it up. You'll see I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> they look at me like, cool. <laughs> She's a pretty good landscaper. <laughs> she, she can dig a good flower bed. Um, I love him. I'm so, so very proud of him. Don't make me cry in here. <laughs> You're going to make me cry. <laughs> but I didn't expect to do this. Um, I've had some of you guys come up to me and say, well, you're in the passenger seat. You see it all. It takes time. You really, really, really have to strive. My husband gets up every morning, puts his shoes on, and he's gone for the day. Draw my kids off school, come back, tell her where I'm going. I usually, I, you know, don't get back till the afternoon appointments. This is mine and my husband's first vacation to another state. Um, it's different. Tends the beach, yeah. Yeah. I didn't take my first vacation until like just a couple months ago. Yeah. And I had plenty of money, like, to go on a vacation at any point. I just like could not stop. I was like, I am not gonna stop until I know that if I stop for three days, there's gonna be deals still coming in so I won't lose any money. Yeah. And I didn't go on a vacation until I got to that point. We went with our kids, but this is our actual first vacation out of the state by ourselves. Um, I don't like it. when you're able to <clears throat> afford to buy plane tickets and come down here and meet different people and um, do things that you want to do. It's nice. It's, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Uh, please, thank you for everything, putting up with it. So it's funny how our, our, our paths crossed. He has a very similar story to me, and a lot of you have in here, but it, it doesn't matter, dude, like long as you know what your why. So if you're interested, and doing a partnership to understand, I've already seasoned with them. I've spent a lot of time. I'm not experimenting. Like, I know what I'm doing. I've done it with this guy. I've done it with countless people. I actually, I enjoy it. I tell him all the time, this guy, what? He goes, I got this great commercial property. I go, just do it yourself. Like, do it. And he's always like, I go, you don't need me. Like, he's like, what do you mean? You don't want the money for it? I go, it's not about the money with me. Like, I really get like a natural high off of this. Some people go to the bar. I go to wholesaling. I enjoy it. So he's cut his teeth. So now he's getting ready to go to the new trajectory. I want to get everybody to this level because when you do it, then you got the tools, you got resources, you got money. You, you will start to make incredible decisions, get great CPAs. I brought Bill, you guys got value with him. You got to look at CPAs like that now. Not, dude, most CPAs are just, yeah, uh, do it like this. I'm like, it drives me nuts. I go, what do you mean? I go, it's, it's a capital gain. I go, it's not a capital gains. So there's so many levels to this. I, I can't. Thank you guys enough for coming out here. I appreciate it, man. This guy's amazing. <laughs>